Okay, thank you. So welcome back. And we are considering continuing our deliberation of H145, an act uh, relating to amending the standards for law enforcement force and continuing our testimony. And we would now like to invite, I hope I get your name right, Zachary Hazard from uh, Disability Rights. And excuse me if I did not pronounce your name correctly. Welcome. I don't think we've thank met you. you before. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks uh, for inviting me. Um, just for the record, uh, my name is Zachary Hosed, uh, close on the, on the name there. Um, it is a unique one. Uh, I'm a staff attorney at Disability Rights Vermont. And again, thank you so much for, for inviting me to, to come and talk to you this morning. And hopefully I can help answer any questions that you have. Um, before I sort of get into my, my testimony of this bill, specifically just a little um, background information on Disability Rights Vermont and just generally what we do for your knowledge. Um, so we are the protection and advocacy organization in Vermont. Um, our role under that is to protect and advocate for the rights of people with disabilities. Our work um, in this area is very broad, including uh, addressing abuse and neglect in a number of situations, including um, care facilities, prisons um, in the community, including law enforcement, uses of force, um, we also deal with issues of discrimination and housing, employment, and, and other areas as well. Uh, we also represent victims of crimes in, um, in that situation as well. So very broad, broad work that we do. We are also the Vermont uh, Mental Health uh, Ombudsman as well. Um, and also for your information, I included a report that we produced last year, Wrongly Confined, um, which looks at Vermont's current uh, healthcare system, community healthcare system. And that's relevant sort of for your knowledge in terms of, you know, situating this bill of police law enforcement into the, the larger context of what is going on in the community for people with disabilities um, and really identifying that there is a, you know, we worked with a national expert on that and that there really is a need in Vermont for a more robust community uh, system of care. Um, law enforcement and People with disabilities is something that Disability Rights Vermont has been working on for, for a long time. We were involved with Act 80 in the development of, of law enforcement training on working with people with disabilities. Uh, we we're also involved in the development of the, the statewide taser policy and, and practices, um, which the, the statute on that is 20 VSA 2367, um, which I'll mention later because I think that's relevant in terms of your work on this bill as well. Um, we also work with and collaborate with uh, various agencies, including departmental health on these issues, as well as the designated, designated agencies, which are the community, um, community care agencies um, on this issue of law enforcement and people with disabilities. Uh, and we also work with and at times represent individuals who have been harmed by uses of force. So we're very involved in this issue on, on many levels. Um, you know, the reason that this is so important for people with disabilities is that people with disabilities are disproportionately impacted by, by law enforcement. Um, you know, nationally, about one in 20 uh, encounters of law enforcement are with people with um, disabilities, particularly mental illness. Um, and most of those encounters are individuals um, in, a, in some sort of crisis or in some sort of low level misdemeanor um, potential activity uh, or um, sort of uh, minor nuisance behavior sorts of things. Um, at the same time, uh, one study has found that uh, people with disabilities, particularly mental illness, um, are 16 times more likely to be killed by law enforcement. Um, so just again, people with disabilities are disproportionately impacted, involved with law enforcement and at a higher risk of, of use of force being done to them and, and that being potentially lethal. Um, and so our, our comments really on, on this bill is that um, we think that there should be more in the bill about uh, working with and serving people with disabilities. Um, and under the Vermont Fair Housing and Public Accommodations Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, reasonable accommodations have to be provided to people with disabilities, and that includes law enforcement providing reasonable accommodations. And we think that this bill would be um, stronger, would benefit from some language in it 
uh, that sort of makes those um, those standards um, clear and, and you know, concise for, for law enforcement's guidance. Um, and so we provided some redlined edits to as a you know some suggestions of, of ways to possibly um, you know, incorporate those standards from the ADA and Vermont Fair Housing Public Accommodations Act into this bill. Um, and again, going back to the, the Taser law, if you take a look at that statute, that requires officers to document what they you know what they understood about an individual's disability and how they tried to accommodate and de-escalate the situation um, and so that could be something to look at as sort of guidance in drafting this bill and how to incorporate that here as well um, and again the idea being that officers have to be cognizant of uh, individuals disability and then accommodate that as well um, can i just interrupt real, real quick could you direct me to that provision again for the taser law? You mentioned it earlier, but I missed it when you said that. Sure, no problem. Uh, that is, let's see if I can find it. Uh, so that is 20 VSA 2367. Thanks. Of course. Um, yeah, so with, with that, I'll sort of open up and try to answer any questions you have. I'll just also mention sort of um, you know, that other comments that have been made in terms of uh, creating a private right of action and qualified immunity, we, we support those, those um, comments as well. Um, so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate, <clears throat> excuse me, I appreciate your testimony. And, um, and it's nice to meet you this first time you've appeared here before. So thank you. Not seeing any, any hands at this Hi, uh, Martin. Yeah, I, I have, uh, I've, I've looked at uh, the language that you did propose uh, and we, we did look in uh, quite a bit last year as far as really the known or should have known type standard and for various reasons landed on the, uh, you know, the known standard. But, but I guess I have a, a question or with respect to the, the second component uh, or the second part of what you uh, have provided, which is what the officer should do uh, if they know of a subject's uh, uh, impairment, uh, it, it seems to me, maybe this is more of a comment, but I, I just want to make the comment and have you respond to it if you wish, um, that what you're laying out there is exactly the kind of thing that uh, should be part of the policy that law enforcement is using to put our standards into place. So we've really been trying to do a balance of what should be in the statutory standards, uh, directing law enforcement on a higher level with the understanding, and this is something we had in the, uh, in the S-119 that passed, requiring them to report back to us on, on the policy, but allowing the flexibility for the law enforcement and their expertise to put into place the details as far, as far as how to implement that policy. And it would seem that the, the way to, uh, to get appropriate professional and peer assistance and the like is absolutely something that should be part of that policy. Absolutely should be something that law enforcement should do. But I feel if we're putting it in the statute, we, we may be actually restricting or, or limiting the different things that we would want the law enforcement uh, in their development of the policy to lay out as options to deal with these situations. So we purposely tried to keep it flexible and keep it relatively broad, but making clear that law enforcement has to take that into account. I don't know if that made sense, but if you could comment on that, but I just wanted to let you know the, the purpose behind this or what we're trying to accomplish with this. And I guess one of the questions, a follow-up question is, is have you been working with uh, the Department of Public Safety in their efforts to put that policy in, into place to make sure that something like this is in the policy? Sure, I appreciate those comments and um, you know, the broader picture of sort of what all is, is happening here. Um, yeah, I think, you know, again, we just made these as some some suggestions, and I think your comment about you know wanting to see these things in the policy is great, and maybe. Maybe the solution then would be some sort of um, some sort of language in the bill, you know, directing um, directing the policy to include 
know, guidance and, and a specific direction um, along these lines. And so maybe, you know, the language would be a little broader, but the idea being um, something about providing, you know, accommodation for people with disabilities. And um, you know, so that could be, that could be one way to, to address this. In terms of your question, yeah, yeah, and, and let me just as a follow up is, I th I think the intent of of the committee and, and in conjunction with government operations committee uh, is to see what comes out of this policy making process uh, of the Vermont State Police and, and the rest of law enforcement in the state, and if they, if 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 it's lacking, and, and we would look to people like you as well. Uh, if it's lacking, we want to understand that, and perhaps we then have to put more into statute. Uh, so this could be somewhat of an iterative process, but we are very much um, want to be able to defer to law enforcement to put these kind of operationalizing aspects into into effect. Uh, but if if things like this are are missing, then that's something that. I, at least I would want to, uh, assuming that I continue in my uh, legislative role uh, in the future, would want to definitely look at and, and make sure that the policy really is sufficient. So there is this balance right now. I don't know that we need to do what you're suggesting at this point, because I'm sending a message right now, and we have been sending this message on this bill, that we're giving you law enforcement the chance to put those policies in place that are sufficient to address this situation. If that's not the case, we wanna hear from you and others in the community and ourselves that that, that did not happen. Sure, I, I appreciate that, that comment as well. And um, sort of answer your earlier question about us working with Department of Public Safety. Um, you know, I did look at the proposed policy and. Um, my office proposed uh, issued some comments on that as well, um, and we're certainly available to to consult. However, we can be helpful um, again for both the committee and for um, Department of Public Safety. Um, you know, I, I think that you know again in terms of having language, you know, specifically more directing um, on how the policy, you know, some some things that the policy might want to include about you know how to interact with people with disabilities. Um, you know, I hear what you're, what you're suggesting in terms of you can always go back and, you know, the legislature can go back and fix it later. Um, just the one concern I'll raise on that is that could, that takes time and um, there's a risk people with disabilities could be harmed in the meantime. And, um, you know, sort of striking that balance of providing direction, but not too much, um, you know, specifics is, is something that's difficult to work out. But um, to the extent there can be a little bit more um, direction on that, I think that would be that would be helpful. Um, appreciate, it. thanks. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. It's helpful. Uh, any anybody else? Okay, not seeing any other questions from the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really appreciate you being here today and and um, the documents that are that are posted. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Will Dwight. Good morning, welcome. I'm coming. <laughs> okay. There you are, good morning. Good morning. My name is Wilda White and I am the uh, founder of an organization called Matt Freedom, which is uh, an organization whose mission is to um, secure political power for psychiatric survivors to end the discrimination against us based uh, on our perceived mental state. Um, we are an organization that's run by and for um, people who've been labeled or diagnosed with, um, with mental illnesses. Um, I thank you again for the opportunity to um, testify on this bill. Seems like my camera is turning, is freezing. So I'm gonna turn my camera off. Um, that's fine. Great, thank you. I'll try it, I'll try it. If, it. if it persists, I'll just turn it off so it won't be as distracting. Um, I actually uh, very much uh, like um, uh, many, if not all of the uh, proposed amendments to this H-145. Um, I think the um, definition of chokehold is um, much improved. I like that it has been renamed. 
Um, so it now really actually reflects th uh, that it's not a prohibited restraint because apparently it's the uh, attention of this committee to allow um, chokeholds in, in limited circumstances. I also think you've sufficiently eliminated a lot of the proof problems um, that I discussed in my last um, time I testified with the earlier definition. Um, and I also appreciate that you've eliminated the need for uh, intent to cause bodily injury uh, or the result of uh, in the definition of a chokehold, because as I uh, tried to convey, um, chokeholds have now become a, a form of terror in and of themselves uh, for many Black Americans, regardless of whether they cause um, kind of a physical um, bodily injury. And so I very much support the direction of, of, this, um, of this new definition. And I also greatly appreciate the elimination of the word bystander uh, from the totality of the circumstances um, definition, uh, because I believe even if bystander is implicit in the totality of the circumstances definition without it, um, it's really important that that word bystander not appear in the language because to do so, it signals to a court that somehow this um, legislative body had determined that there actually could be an instance where a bystander could justify the use of force against a, um, a third party. Um, and, and because this legislature really has not done so, I appreciate the removal of the word bystander um, from that definition. And I also uh, appreciate the removal of the words without the benefit of, of hindsight. Uh, for all the reasons I talked before. Um, I would suggest though, that when we move down to, um, it's page five, uh, uh, subdivision C6, which currently reads, a law enforcement officer shall not use a chelk hold on a person unless lethal force is justified pursuant to subdivision C1 of this section. I have a suggestion. I suggest um, that you substitute the word deadly for lethal because this is the first time the word lethal has appeared in the bill um, and it's not defined. Um, and the word that you have used throughout the bill to date is deadly force. Um, and so just for the sake of consistency, um, I would suggest that you can you be consistent and, and use the phrase deadly force anytime you're referring to lethal force. And then I also have um, a question and perhaps a suggestion about your referencing, referencing um, subdivision C1 of this section. It seems to me that you haven't uh, referenced all of the sections um, that, um, I'm not sure whether it's, it's also important um, to reference, for example, um, C2 and C, three um, and C4 um, because uh, you know C C C three and four <clears throat> actually qualify C1 and C1. Um, and so it's just actually a question in my mind um, whether uh, a court will uh, assume because you've only referenced C1, whether you meant to um, uh, not incorporate also the restrictions and limitations of C3 and C4. Um, then moving on to C7, um, a law enforcement officer has a duty to intervene when the officer observes another officer using a chokehold on a person. Again, I wonder here if you need to include the exception that you've carved out. So I don't think you're going to be asking a law enforcement officer to intervene when a, when a, a fellow officer is using a chokehold when deadly force is justified. So the question is, do you need to incorporate, um, it maybe need to add an law, enforce, law enforcement officer has a duty to intervene when the officer observes another officer using a chokehold on a person and then add unless lethal force is justified uh, pursuant to sec subdivision C134 of this section. Uh, just a question. 
Um, Before you move on on that, if I could, uh, uh, Maxine. So, so on that, yeah, I, I've pondered that as, as well, as far as whether to have that language. And, and this is something I'd certainly want to hear from law enforcement as, as well. But uh, it, it seems in a situation where even when lethal force is, is uh, justified, deadly force, I, I'll, I'll keep saying deadly force, because I agree that with that change to change lethal to deadly. But when deadly force is justified and somebody is using a chokehold, that other law enforcement even in that situation should presumably be intervening, uh, I would think. I mean, if their person is grappling and on the ground and is using a chokehold, presumably the law enforcement officer is gonna be intervening to assist with that situation anyway. Uh, so that's kind of was my thinking, but this is certainly probably more a question for law enforcement and how they run into these situations. Um, so I just wanted, I don't know if you have a comment on, on that or not, uh, Wilda. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking similarly that you, would, you might be still expecting law enforcement to kind of help out because if a fellow officer is in trouble to the point where they're using that, that they would um, be intervening. But I don't know if they would be intervening to stop the law enforcement officer to stop using a chokehold. I think they would be intervening to assist the officer and helping the officer kind of save their life. So, you know, I'm... Um, I like real, like real cl clarity in, in legislation and, and, and I really like the legislator's intent to be really clear in, in legislation. And so I just raised the issue um, so that I can hear some, you know, we can all hear some discussion about it and we can all be on the same page about it. Um, I, I'm, I'm really interested in what law enforcement would have to say about that. Um, Actually, excuse me, um, Selena has her hand up. Oh, yes. Um, and you, I'm sorry, I had to hit respond to something uh, um, on the side for a moment. So you may have already, um, you may have already shared some information about this just in your last statement that I missed. And I apologize if that's true, but I'm, I have a more general question just about um, subsections C, I mean, so, I'm sorry, subsection six here, and just curious to hear your general thoughts on um, the direction of carving um, out this kind of exception for the use of chokehold and whether or not that's good policy direction for us to go. And <laughs> I would have a hard time voting in favor of a, an exception. If I were a legislator, I, I probably would not vote for, in favor of an exception to the chokehold. But at the same time, I'm 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 a think of myself as a, a, a fair minded and reasonable person. And if a law enforcement officer were um, his life, his or her life were in jeopardy, uh, I would uh, think the law enforcement for some officer could do anything to, to save their life. Um, I, I do think their lives is, are just as valuable as anybody else's life. And they should have, you know, they should be able to do whatever they can to save their own life. Um, but in terms of carving out that exception in statute, I would not do it. I would allow the justifiable homicide statute um, to, to do that work. Um, and then I would avoid um, a situation that um, I think it was representative um, not raised, which is also a problem that I have with the statute where you're saying you're not going to teach it, but you're allowed to use it. Um, that to me is, um, it, it's just, a, it's, a, it's really a, a conflict that, that can't be resolved. It, it's just something I, you can't really resolve it, right? I mean, um, if you have any kind of intellectual integrity um, I don't think you can say you can use a chokehold, but we're not going to teach you how to use it. Um, so for me, I would allow the justifiable homicide statute to do the work, and I wouldn't not put um, something in statute that would allow you to do, use a chokehold. Um, and that's really, you know, based on my, you know, feelings about chokeholds, the place chokeholds have come to occupy in our society, the, the terror I feel. Um, and that I know other um, Black people feel, the way I've seen chokeholds uh, reenacted at Black Lives Matter protests, um, the ways I know that, you know, even kind of walking the rail trail near my house and encountering a person um, who wants to terrify me 
Um, they will borrow these types of incidents from, um, which are now part of popular culture uh, and just uttering the words, right? So just because of the place chokeholds old for me, um, I would not codify uh, their use. But at the same time, I would not penalize an officer who was on trial for using a chokehold to save his or her life. I would, um, I would, I, I would likely vote, you know, to acquit based on the justifiable homicide statute. So those are my feelings. That is really helpful. Thank you. And um, so, I mean, I, I think that pretty much um, concludes my uh, testimony on on the on the proposed uh, changes. Um, I, I would like to, um, uh, just because he immediately preceded me, um, Zachary Hosett's um, proposed amendment. It's something that Nat Freedom is not in favor of. Um, I, I, we much prefer the language that's in the statute. Um, I think that the proposal is well-meaning, but it's also actually more narrow than um, what's already in the statute and doesn't really get at what, um, what, we're, what this language was, for, in my mind, is trying to get at. So, um, and I'm talking again about B5, where if a law enforcement officer knows that a subject's conduct um, is due to a, a mental health condition, et cetera, they have to take that into account. Um, the change that um, Mr. Hosett has, has proposed is narrower because he's conflating disability with, for example, mental illness. Mental illness does not always result in a disability. Um, um, you know, I, I have a, I've been diagnosed with a severe mental illness. I don't consider myself disabled. Um, and so, uh, and the ADA only protects people who are disabled. And so, um, B5 is broader than that. B5 protects anybody whose conduct um, um, is based on a mental health condition uh, or whatever. And so it's broader. And the other thing is, um, I agree with Representative Malone that what, what uh, Mr. Hosett is proposing is more appropriate in policy. I also think the American Disability with Disabilities Act does a lot of the work here. We don't need to adopt that into this use of force statute. Remember, this is a use of force statute. This is not, um, and only a, a use of force statute. And I also think as a person who's, um, you know, all too familiar with the mental health system that um, it's not always um, helpful to uh, call in professional assistance. Um, that system has been just as harmful as law enforcement uh, in many regards. And so while well-meaning, um, I think um, it's not helpful to the, to, certainly to the, to the people who I represent, my constituents and that freedom, who are not all, who are not all disabled, um, but who may very well have a run-in with the police officer because um, they might be experiencing an episode, an episode of psychosis or because of diabetic coma, whatever. Um, I think the language that's currently in the bill is, is uh, much broader uh, and much to the point in terms of use of force. So that concludes my testimony. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wilder. Always, always appreciate your, your input and your testimony. I do see some hands. Um, I'm going to call on Coach Martin. I know your hand was up first, but we haven't heard from Coach yet today. So, Coach. Uh, good morning. Um, I'd like to thank the witnesses uh, uh, for their testimony this morning, uh, Wilda uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Hosick. Um, I went back to my notes. Um, from our original discussions on S-119 and then uh, a year and a half ago when we heard from Drew Bloom, who is the chief instructor at the pol police academy. He said succinctly, he does not teach chokeholds and he has not taught them. Um, and I, I, I knew that was the case, but I went back to my notes. Um, and when we were discussing this 
back um, when we did S-119. Uh, he came in and testified, uh, and he also testified to a joint committee um, at the beginning of uh, the biennium, the last biennium, um, that uh, Madam Chair uh, and her counterpart You got put on mute again, uh, Coach. Sorry, uh, I like I said, I had two kittens. Um, the uh, <laughs> he when he offered that testimony uh, in order to help the new members of the committee, maybe we could request that uh, he return just to uh, uh, reiterate uh, the protocol for training at the academy. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. Martin. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Wilda. I, I want you to go back to look at uh, the chokehold definition. I had a question on that. <clears throat> Do you think that this covers, or if we might need some other language, uh, a situation where a law enforcement officer is using a baton uh, to uh, have a chokehold? I mean, that's not necessarily part of the law enforcement officer's body. And I'm wondering if we need to make somehow clear that it can either be the body or some piece of equipment that the law enforcement officer might have uh, that he's, he or she is using uh, to, to uh, limit the person's breathing or blood flow. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> um... I think in order to be complete, I guess you would have to say, um, yeah, I, I think I would agree that as that this statute would not prohibit a law enforcement officer from using a baton or another instrument to um, limit the person's bleeding or blood flow. So. All right, so, so I guess I'll ask Bryn to maybe look and try to figure out what kind of language might be useful or, you know, is it just a matter of saying a law enforcement officer's body or equipment or, you know, something like that, but we can try to- Well, you know, a court would say, a court who was trying to find that it was a chokehold even with the baton would say if the police officer were holding the baton it becomes part of their body. I can see a court saying that. Um, uh, But you know, there's always that does create some wiggle room, um, and there, I don't think there's any way for a police officer to to um, to, to use equipment that they're not holding right in their hands or um, but it's yeah. I guess you know, Bryn. I mean, I, do you have any? I, I see you jumped back onto the screen. Do you have any input on this? Um, I think that the definition of prohibited restraint, um, there was quite a bit of conversation in the Senate about that um, when they were crafting the original prohibited restraint definition. So um, the use of any maneuver, I think, is a little bit broader. Um, there may be a way to sort of combine the two definitions to um, broaden it to include the use of any maneuver um, that doesn't necessarily restrict it to a body part. <clears throat> I can work on that if the committee wants me to. I, yeah, I would certainly think we should look at that alternative language because yeah, we don't want to, the intent was not to narrow from uh, what we had before in the Senate as far as the maneuver language. All right, thanks. And, and, and perhaps uh, law enforcement could comment on that as well when they, when they testify. Great, thank you. Any other, any other questions from committee members? I 
Again, uh, Wilda, thank you so much. So appreciate your testimony. Thank, thank you. Um, okay, I'm gonna go a little bit out of order. I'm gonna um, call on- um, Thank you, I appreciate being here. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm gonna call on Major Ingrid Jonas now. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. Can you hear me all right? Absolutely, good morning. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Ingrid Jonas, for the record, I'm a major a division commander with the Vermont State Police. Uh, this is actually the first time I've been here with you all to discuss this, so I appreciate the invitation to come here and comment on the bill. Um, and also want to note, as others have mentioned, the thoughtfulness of the work going into this um, to amend standards for police use of force. Um, all of you um, witnesses and members of the committee involved in the process seem to really share overarching goals of wanting a policy that we can be proud of in Vermont and which helps build trust, clarity, and improve um, our police capability and training. Um, just briefly, I feel like the work is about optimizing safety and dignity and ensuring that officers in Vermont approach the varied circumstances to which we're called uh, with the appropriate care and concern for people. Um, it feels like it's about slowing things down uh, whenever that is possible for us and reducing the instances where police ourselves create situations that result in the use of force. So I want to be clear that we share in these goals. Um, reducing the frequency and severity of uses of force is in everyone's best interest. Um, it's very important to us that as we continue this important work, we keep at the forefront that policy must be readily understood by every officer in Vermont and must lend itself to the development of effective training and be realistic. Um, we in the police community have been fortunate to have Jen Morrison, although she was unable to be here today, but she's been at the helm for us in this process. And I just wanna recognize her leadership um, she's really pulled us together, state police, the chiefs, the sheriffs, the police association, troopers association, and I believe we're speaking with one voice um, and support the improvements that she's been articulating to you and the committee in her prior testimony. Um, drilling down into the specifics of this latest draft, we've reviewed it and um, I have a, some bullet points that I just wanna mention for the record. So we have no objection to changing the term from prohibited restraint to chokehold. Um, we do offer two suggestions to improve the proposed definition and you started to speak of it um, a moment ago. First, uh, we feel the definition should be broader than just actions that involve the placement of any part of law enforcement officer's body on or around a person's neck. That wording does not include scenarios where an officer might come up from behind a person and use, uh, as you mentioned, a baton to press against their neck. It doesn't contemplate an officer intentionally using a person's clothing or say a scarf against them to strangle them. Um, so we recommend adjusting the language accordingly. Um, second, we feel the definition of chokehold should include intention on the part of the officer to limit the person's breathing or blood flow. Um, and we feel that way because there are times during physical um, instances, particularly on the ground or when grappling with someone who might be trying to evade custody, arrest or detention, when a part of our body could be against or around a person's neck without the intention of placing the person into what is effectively a chokehold. Additionally, as written, this definition doesn't account for like a hit or a strike that misses its intended mark um, during a struggle and causes the person momentary dif difficulty in breathing. Number two, we support the addition of section C6, which clarifies that a chokehold is uh, permissible when lethal force is warranted. Um, Number three, we note that the definition of totality of the circumstances has now omitted the word bystanders. Uh, based on the testimony of others and statements by the author of this, of S-119, Representative Lalonde, we will 
trust that any actions by a bystander that are significant enough to change an officer's course of action would be considered as part of the totality of the circumstances. Um, the fourth item is we've noted that the most recent draft has omitted two of the primary language additions that we had requested. Specifically, the law enforcement community asked that, quote, without the benefit of hindsight, be added to B4, and that section B5 be appended to start with to the extent feasible or when feasible. Um, the testimony that we heard about those, in addition to comments from the author and legislative council, consistently state that the addition of these words don't change anything. They're unnecessary or redundant. And so we want to be on the record with this committee that we believe these words do matter and we feel they are necessary. You've heard testimony on this from Jen Morrison, and I won't take up more committee time, but want to be clear that the addition of these phrases is a top priority for the law enforcement community. Um, the fifth and final item is um, that this, the joint team of DPS and the Vermont League of Cities and Towns policy and legal staff have completed their review of all feedback received to date on the draft use of force policy as posted in December. Um, the group is anxious to move forward with a second draft and, look, and they look forward to seeing this bill move along so that we can understand the legislative mandates that form the framework for the statewide policy. Um, we obviously cannot develop training until we have policy and we cannot finalize policy until we have legislation. With all of that in mind, we request a pushback of the implementation date uh, for section one to September 1st of 2021. I think that summarizes my comments and the bullet points we wanted to make for the record. So thank you all. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And uh, I don't know if you have submitted your, um, your bullet points, your testimony, but if, if you are able to, um, that I think that would be helpful if, if that does work for you. Certainly. Great, thanks. Um, Martin, see your hand up. Yeah, uh, a couple questions, but just one real quick statement regarding those two changes on subsection four and five, just to, just to be clear. Uh, I would, I would uh, say that they are redundant at best and actually can be confusing those, those two additions. So I just wanna make it clear, it's not just a matter of, of uh, thinking that those are surplusage or redundant language. I, I think it, it does add confusion. So putting that aside, there's not a question there. The questions I have, I have two questions. One is with respect to the C7, as far as the, the duty to intervene, and you probably heard the discussion between Will DeWight and me, uh, as far as whether that should uh, specifically <clears throat> state that unless deadly force is justified or, or is this, is this appropriate that if there's a, a chokehold used, even if, if uh, deadly force is justified, that there should be intervention? You know, I, I would want to, I guess, contemplate that more. I feel like if, if something as severe as a lethal, for, a lethal force, deadly force um, maneuver is justified, warranted in a situation. Um, I don't cognitively understand where intervening fits in. Do you understand? Like, I don't, I haven't contemplated it to the extent you might need me to, but intervening when there is such a degree of force required that lethal or deadly force is being applied. I don't compute about intervening in that. I think I, it's- I, yeah. I do believe that uh, Jim Morrison uh, offered uh, language that would have done just what we've talked about or, and what mm -hmm. White talked about. So the, the other question I have is, there was a question about training. Uh, it was my understanding that, that training does not include training on chokeholds. Is that, is that correct? And how long has that been the case? Correct. So my understanding of training at the Vermont Police Academy is similar to what Representative Christie mentioned um, that essentially 
it's not referred to as chokeholds, it's re referred to as, um, I'm trying to find the right verbiage. Um, I'm sorry, but these maneuvers were taught in such a way to help an officer understand how to get out from such a type of lethal force being used against them, a vas uh, vascular neck restraint. Um, but those maneuvers have not been taught at the Vermont Police Academy for quite some time. All right, thank you. Uh, Ken. Hi, good morning, Ingrid. When did you say, um, when did you say the date of, uh, for this to go into effect uh, that you wanted or you thought? You um, our request is September 1st. And just refresh me, how long is uh, the officer's training? The basic academy is 16 weeks. Okay, thank you for now. You're welcome. Okay. Anybody else? I'm not seeing other hands from our committee. Okay, great, thank you. Appreciate thank your you. testimony. Thank you so much. Okay, um, how about Chief Burke, please? South Burlington. Good morning. morning, Madam Chair. It's good to see everyone here again this morning. I appreciate your time and careful, uh, thoughtful, uh, and thought provoking testimony that's been given to be uh, very succinct. Uh, as Major Jonas eloquently stated, the entire Vermont law enforcement community is um, on board with uh, the reform that this committee, our communities, and our profession are striving for. Um, I think that everything has been well stated here this morning. The only thing from the perspective of the Vermont chiefs that I'd like to um, highlight is the intent of chokehold. And uh, when you look at and investigate other crimes, assaults, things of that nature, those are specific intent crimes. And I don't feel as though that that is clear in the statute. And given the mechanics of uh, how force encounters evolve, um, oftentimes there would be periods in which a, a portion of the officer's body may come into contact with a neck, a torso, and may cause um, a lateral restraint without the intent of doing so. So I think that needs to be uh, further deliberated. And when you're doing so, just please reflect on the number of hours of testimony that have been given on a topic that our officers need to critically evaluate and execute in the street in seconds. So um, this is really hard work and we need to distill it down so we can train our officers to have the outcomes that Vermonters want. But please keep in mind that these incidents do occur in seconds. So again, thanks for your time and I appreciate it. I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Appreciate your testimony. Martin. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Chief. Um, so with respect to the intent language, it, it would seem, maybe this is just a comment that I'm gonna just open up for you to comment on or others. I, there's two places. We have the definition of chokehold. And frankly, I think having the definition just talk about the maneuver is what's critical there. It's when we get into, uh, well, what is the result of the use of a chokehold? And, and right now, uh, if a chokehold is used and it's not in a, a lethal force situation, uh, then, then uh, one could look at you know, the disciplinary uh, proceedings primarily. If it results in, in death, that, that really is, goes to the offense that was created in uh, S219 and it seems to be there where intent might, that, that's the proper place in my view as far as whether to have intent or not. And I, I look at it and we do not have an intention there. It is if, if a uh, chokehold is used and it results in serious bodily injury or death, uh, there, there's not an intent factor there. 
if if any place, and I'm uh, that that's presumably where it should go, not not just for a definition of chokehold. So maybe there wasn't a question there. I apologize, but you're welcome to comment on on what I just uh, stated. No, uh, thank you, thank you, Martin. Um, I, I follow your logic, and I think that's the appropriate way to approach this. Um, I just you know also just highlighting what was already talked about in, in the definition to make sure that it's captured there um, fully what um, what the intent of this legislation is. But the intent of applying a chokehold needs to be addressed in the latter portion, portion of the statute, the actual force portion of the statute. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ken. So do we, this has probably already been talked about do we know how many times a chokehold has actually been used in Vermont? Is that is that something that's tracked uh, when an officer is giving a report or anything? So all um, all Vermont law enforcement agencies that have a use of force uh, policy that I'm aware of have a use of force reporting component. There is not, unfortunately, a centralized database for this. Um, I've worked at um, two agencies since the advent of um, lateral neck restraints in, in law enforcement, and uh, I believe I can recall one time in one instance greater than a decade ago where a lateral neck restraint was used in the field. Do you know if we've had any deaths in Vermont because of the chokehold? I am not aware of any uh, fatal outcomes related to lateral neck restraints in the state of Vermont. Any idea how many injuries because of it? No, sir. Thank you. Anybody else? Can I ask another question? Absolutely. Do you think 16 weeks of training at the academy is sufficient for law enforcement in Vermont? Are they doing, a, doing their job? I think the uh, Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council and the staff at the Vermont Police Academy are doing an amazing job with that 16 weeks. Um, this profession has changed a great deal um, since my time at the Police Academy, which was 26 years ago. Um, you know, in terms of what is needed in, for added education and time. I think that's really tough uh, to judge. I feel as though that we're against the rev limiter and that the academy is going to have to contemplate extensions. And uh, another careful metric that we look at are the duration of our field training programs. So just uh, by way of example, at South Burlington PD, once you leave the academy, then you come back to us and you are in a 16 week field training program where you ride with uh, upwards of four senior trained officers to actually learn how to apply your trade in the field. Um, and those are things that we're always balancing. And of course, you know, even meaningful legislation like this will lead to increased training times, both at the recruit level and then now at the in-service level to ensure that officers are staying uh, contemporary in, in all practices and discipline. I think there's a whole other conversation about our involvement in uh, response to those suffering in crisis situations where we need to, as a society, begin to really take this apart. We tend to really focus on the incident and we're not looking left of that incident to where the gaps in community-based resources exist that allow folks to spin uh, out of control to where they become a danger to themselves or others. And really from from a passionate place of wanting to serve a community and leave all residents safely and with their dignity, I really wish we could focus on left of the incident and try to figure out what gaps exist in terms of mental health services that are community-based, substance use um, services that are community-based, and other things that those subject matter experts can give uh, valuable insight to. Thank you. Are we seeing um, in the last year or so, are we having a harder time uh, recruiting people to go into law enforcement field? 
the raw numbers are really low. Um, I will say that um, we, we used to see hundreds of applications for one position, um, but since 2014, a lot's changed in the profession um, and the economy has been fairly decent. Uh, and when the economy is fairly decent, we don't see a lot of people running uh, to, to police uh, as a career. But what I do see are uh, recruits that we hire now that understand that policing is a service um, they understand some of the struggles the professions had and want to be part of the reform moving forward. Good to hear. Thank you. Um, that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Committee. Okay, great. As always, thank you very much, Chief Burke. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it. Good, good to see you. Okay, uh, how about um, Falco Schilling, ACLU, next please. Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here today. My name is Falco Schilling. I'm the advocacy director for the ACLU of Vermont. Um, so I think my, my comments today are gonna be in fact quite short um, in looking at the proposed changes to H145. Um, we, we basically, uh, we wanna say one, we really appreciate in particular the change to B4 um, and the elimination of the um, at pre previously added language uh, without the benefit of hindsight. Um, so that was one of our biggest concerns with this bill as it was um, introduced. So we are fine, we really appreciate that change and think it is important because it did add in our perspective um, it's some confusion um, in terms of the court's scope of inquiry and feel that that was actually captured in the totality of the circumstances as previously discussed. So um, that is something we greatly appreciate. Um, the change to chokehold is one that um, I, we, we are fine with, though we also uh, will note the, the, the issues that Representative Lalonde raised earlier and that there might be a need to slightly refine this uh, further. Um, so appreciate that. And um, looking throughout the statute, yeah, basically we, we support these changes uh, as uh, was introduced to the committee today um, and have no objection to them. So I think that's basically our, our testimony on uh, the proposed changes to 145 that were shared um, today. Great, thank you. Uh, Selena. Um, yeah, I just, I'm, can I ask the same question that I asked of um, Will Dwight earlier, just how you feel about carving out that exception on the chokehold and kind of what message that it sends to do that versus rely on the justifiable homicide statute? So I, I think I remember the question, I'll do my best to answer it. And if I miss anything, please, um, please correct me. But in terms of the use of a chokehold in a situation where deadly force would be available to an officer, we think that that should be included as a justifiable defense and understand that um, the solely relying on the justifiable, justifiable homicide statute would require that there was a homicide to use that defense. Um, so we do not object to carving that out and making that more explicit in part because we would want to see um, if this is a form of so, sometimes less deadly force than maybe a firearm or another situation, another type of force that could be used. Um, so I think that's appropriate in making that more clear. Um, so we don't have an objection to that. And then I believe the other question that was discussed earlier is the, the component around training and the um, prohibition on using this sort of training within the, the police academy. And um, we're supportive of that as, as uh, folks have mentioned earlier, that is not something that's currently happening. This training is not currently happening within uh, law enforcement and putting that prohibition would not change any practices. Um, and we heard testimony before that there was a concern that allowing that training to continue might mean that it is more likely to be used. Um, basically what the way, how we see this and how we see this law currently constructed to allow a law enforcement officer to use um, some sort of um, you know chokehold on in a situation where deadly force might otherwise be necessary. You know this is a, a situation where they might be grappling for their life, um, and so 
think it's appropriate to not be training on that, but to make that more explicit when that defense could be used. Selena, I'm just giving you time to take oh. notes and see if you had any follow up or no. Okay, no, that's helpful. Thank you. Appreciate it. Great, thank you. Questions from other committee members? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. your testimony. Thank you, and happy to add anything more if there's any more questions. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, um, Chief Pete, please. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, members of the committee. Um, legislation, is, uh, it's a privilege and an honor to be here. Thank you very much again uh, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, if, if I may, I would just, uh, again, uh, uh, echo uh, Chief Burke and uh, Major Jonas's testimony, um, uh, and, and especially to, to re reinforce that the law enforcement community in Vermont is definitely behind this. We want to make sure that we 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 emerge uh, with more trust and improve trust from our communities, um, and that we ensure accountability upon ourselves, our organizations, and our profession. So uh, th I think, you know, we're here, and we want to make sure that we, you know, uh, that we definitely partner in this conversation um, to meet with the spirit and the intent of everything that's going on. Uh, I, I would say that uh, in listening to some of the conversations and the testimony, uh, there was the incident that was brought up about um, using batons or, or, or the potential for, for scarves being uh, uh, restricting airway. Um, if, if the uh, committee would like us to, to go back and to look at that or, or to probably bring up some suggestions or ideas regarding um, suggested lang language, we can definitely consult with our legal folks and with each other and bring something back that may be a good starting point or a decent starting point uh, for the committee. Uh, I also want to again echo um, the issues of intent and feasibility that, that they are uh, important to us um, because we are dealing with those, those specific issues uh, in relating, relating to the law. Um, the, the, the fourth point would, would be in, in kind of looking at some of the things that uh, Chief Burke had mentioned. Uh, I think that there are so many what if situations and scenarios and, and the hard work that you all have been doing, um, it, it's, it's an enviable, um, but uh, it, because this, you, there, you have to look at so many different angles. So you guys are doing a tremendous amount of work, uh, well needed work. Um, but I think that we also need to focus not necessarily on specific incidences. Don't lose sight of the intent of, of what these types of bills are. So, so rather than looking at, you know, that, it, that we should definitely mention chokeholds and prohibitive neck restraints, um, because this is what we've seen. This was, this was something that was really that should not have happened. Um, and we need to make that clear and we need to send that message out there. But we also need to look at not what type of force was applied, but rather the intent of that application because there, you know, tomorrow there may be an incident that uh, someone uh, or law enforcement officer did not use a chokehold, but used something else that may have seriously injured or killed someone. And whether they may have been justified in doing it or not. Um, so, there are going to be so many circumstances and so many situations that I think that we also need to, you know, make sure that we understand. That's I, to me. That's why those words like using intent is extremely important. Um, and then I would, uh, uh, other than that, I think, I think I have nothing else to to say. Um, with the exception of uh, anything that I've echoed. Oh, I'm sorry, I did want to mention one thing regarding trainings, uh, training in, in chokeholds. I, I think that uh, one of the things that, that may be considered, one of, one of our responsibilities is to make sure that we render first aid, uh, especially after a use of force incident within our policies that if we do use use of force, our officers should be evaluating um, uh, the condition of the person that we've, that we've had an encounter with. So, so maybe maybe training, looking at things like 
what are the types of things that you notice when someone has not had has had a you know has not had oxygen flow? So so maybe understanding what those signs and symptoms look like, uh, so that officers can respond appropriately. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I, let's see, I see Ken has a, his hand up. Morning, Chief. How are you? Good, sir. Yourself? Good, good. Thank, thanks for being here. When, a, uh, when one of your officers is called out, are they informed as much as possible if they know who the individual is? Are they informed as much as possible what is... Uh, what that person's about? I, I, I think in, in some cases we may, if it's an individual that may be known to us that, that, that we've, we've dealt with in the past, um, but, but there may be cases in which we, we, we're not fully aware that there may be like immediate hangup calls or, or areas that we haven't been to. Um, so, so, so sometimes yes, sometimes no. So the known the known person that the call went out for that's what if there's a history, that officer is being informed of of uh, of past history as much as possible while they're in group. Oh. I'm sorry, sir. I missed the last few minutes of the of last few seconds of your question. When the call is made and the officer is dispatched. To the person that needs help or is or is a threat, that the that officer is given as much information as possible if it's already a known person of interest or or some dealings with a with law enforcement. Correct. Yes. And if there is any type of uh, physical altercation or anything like that uh, that happens with a suspect or anybody that's around the area or anything like that, there's always a report that's filled out. Uh, for use of force incident, yes, we, we do fill out use of force. And you, I assume all police chiefs or who whoever is in charge of, of that officer is going to go and review each one of these these calls correct if there is a physical altercation yes you should we should definitely be reviewing those they do require gotcha. they do require approval from supervisors right off the bat but in, in the end game depending on how large the department is the chief should definitely be reviewing any use of force incident and Are you having any problems at all keeping a, a full force in Montpelier? Uh, as, as of right now, yeah, we do have two officers that are pursuing other opportunities. Um, uh, and I would say the answer to that is yes. We, we put something out there within one week. We haven't had any submissions. And the problems that we're running into right now are, um, to me, they're multifaceted issues. It's um, But... We're, we've kind of been reduced to the fact that we're trying to steal from each other. So we're, we're if, if I'm going to rob somebody from Burlington to come here, Burlington's going to rob somebody from the county's office to go there. And in and, and, and the grand scheme of things throughout the state, actually nationally, um, yeah, it's a leapfrog game. We don't have enough people coming into the profession. Do you think, um, is this bill or these bills that uh, come up, are they having kind of, do you, do you think an unintended consequence that, uh, that maybe it's pushing applicants away, they don't want to get in law enforcement because they're afraid of, of uh, well, for many reasons? Um, I, that, that's been definitely some of the feedback that I've been given when I'm trying to get folks to come into the profession. That's some of the selling points that I'm trying to use in attracting folks to come over, talking about support. I, I again, uh, uh, home it up to the whole thing of intent. I, I think law enforcement as a whole, especially in the state of Vermont, 
is ready and, and, and has been a leader in police accountability practices for quite some time. Um, but it's, it's looking at the intent behind it. And, it. and if there is a perception that the intent is more of a gotcha game rather than this is in, in response to what the community is, then, then, then it brings into, um, it, it brings people down into coming in because they don't want to be the next person on YouTube. And how long have you been at, uh, been in Vermont as a chief? Uh, since July 1st of 2020. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Anybody else? Thank you, um, Chief. Really appreciate your testimony as always. And um, and certainly if you did want to um, send some, some other language, um, please go ahead and, and do so. Um, we're gonna definitely be coming back to, to this after today. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll let Jen Morrison know. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Martin. Yeah, I, I was hoping that I could go back to Falco on a question and, and actually possible possibly Will Dwight if she's still on as well. And it's something that was brought up by Ingrid and then Sean, and I think somewhat by Chief Pete as well. And that's this question of intent. And you know, in the first instance, I, I really don't think intent should be put into a definition. So putting that aside, but looking at the crime, which right now we, it's, it, we don't have uh, mens rea, we don't have an intent uh, in the particular prohibitive, well, it's called the prohibitive restraint crime now, but it would be changed to chokehold. Um, so I, I'd like I'd like your input on it, but it, it seems to me it's kind of an interesting it's an interesting offense because essentially the offense is if lethal or deadly force was not justified, and you've used this maneuver and it's resulted in serious uh, injury or death then you're liable uh, for, for, for this homicide, which it's almost like the intent is somehow wrapped up into what was the intent as far as was there a lethal or a deadly force situation or not? And I, I'm not, I'm trying to work this out and trying to understand this. And if you have, if you can weigh in on this, Falco, and if uh, Will Dwight, if you want to weigh in on this, this question, I, I'd appreciate it. So thank you um, for the opportunity to chime back in on this. Um, I did not mention that as I was going through my comments. Um, I think our view on this would be that the, you know, we are fine with the language as is that does not speak directly to intent um, because what we are trying to do is prohibit that conduct um, that has that result regardless of, of why uh, and what the intent was behind it. Um, but at the same time would be open to seeing possible language around intent and, and how that would be incorporated into the statute. Um, but don't think that that is necessary since what we are trying to prohibit is that action with that result. No, I appreciate, appreciate that. Um, I, I don't know, Wilda, if, you're, if you wanted to weigh in on that or not. Uh, you know, I was always troubled by the original uh, statute that made the choke hold of crime because it did read to me like a strict liability offense with that it was because it had no mens rea requirement or state of mind requirement for those who um, <clears throat> weren't tortured in law school. Um, so I'm, I'm open to, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm actually open uh, it, it, to having some kind of uh, intent requirement um, because, you know, I've listened to the testimony of law enforcement and, you know, they've talked about how these things can happen in the course of uh, not intending to do so, um, particularly maybe an injury. So I would be open to it um, as, as long as it was, you know, it, it's, it's disfavored, right? Chokeholds are disfavored in Vermont, and um, but I think to 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 charge them with with a crime with the penalties that are attached to it, there there should be some intent. In all fairness, it could it could even be recklessness, presumably. Yes, yeah, it it should certainly not be a strict liability offense. I think, which is kind of, it's kind of what it is, but not 
really, because it's still tied back to whether the deadly force was justified. And that's what I'm trying to work out in my head, that it's not quite a strict liability uh, crime, which which I really disfavor. I don't think you should have strict li liability crimes, but maybe yeah. I should take a it's, little more pondering. Yeah, and, and I don't think it should take this much pondering, right? I mean, when we're when we are attaching severe penalties to, I mean, really significant penalties to something, um, it, it should it should be more clear on the face of the statute what the legislative intent is and what the um, what the elements of the crime are. So. At the very least, it, I think it does need some 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 clarification um, because you know law enforcement is entitled to as much you know due process as the rest of us. Um, so I, I would be in favor of of, of clarifying it. Right. Appreciate that. So while we're kind of backtracking a little bit, uh, I know that Kate just. Uh, uh, had a, a question. I don't know, Kate. If you, are you willing to ask that or? point that question out for us as far as that other provision? Um, sure, I had, I had just reached out to Martin. Um, so looking at section C7, where it talks about a law enforcement officer has a duty to intervene when the officer observes another officer using a chokehold on a person. Currently that is number seven, under section C, which is use of deadly force. And so there's been some discussion of like, does that make sense? Would they intervene if that is the area where we're saying a chokehold could be used? And I was wondering, does it make more sense to move that under subsection B, use of force? Because I think it seems to me like the intent of that portion of the bill is to say that someone should intervene if a chokehold is being used in an instance when it should not be used, which would be as a use of for. So just offering that up and I guess curious about thoughts on that idea. Yeah, I was just wondering if the if any witnesses would have thoughts on that, uh, Maxine. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, where, where were you on that? So <clears throat> the where it is currently, it's on page five of the of the amended version that I'm that we have today. Um, it's C7, um, so section C is addressing use of deadly force. Uh, so it's line 14 on page five. It starts, a law enforcement officer has a duty to intervene when the officer observes another, another officer using a chokehold on a person. The bill is essentially saying we would only use a chokehold in a case of deadly force. So in, it seems like there's some confusion around that. Like, why would someone intervene in that? You know, that like, and I was just, wondering if the intent of that portion of the bill is, is really more to address if a law enforcement officer is using a chokehold as a use of force rather than a use of deadly force. They're using a chokehold in a, in a way that would not be aligned with the intent of the law. And so does it make more sense to move that section under use of force to say, if, if an officer is using a chokehold in an instance when they should not be, then other law enforcement officers have a duty to intervene. Or add more words before the chokehold on, on line 15. I see what, I do see what you're saying. I don't know if you've asked the witnesses to weigh in on that or not. Sure. Yeah, I, I was just going to yeah. say I saw that you were uh, you went off mute, uh, which is another sign for raising one's hand. <laughs> <laughs> I actually yeah. like I, I actually like Representative Donnelly's suggestion. I think it it makes a lot of sense um, to put that in the uh, use of force section. Um, I think it's a pretty elegant solution, actually. Yeah, I. I'm just I would I would agree. Um, I think that would work well in the use of force section. And I also see that there, you know, I don't see it as problematic in the use of deadly force section as well. I think it could work in both because if an officer was using a chokehold and another officer was was at the scene, I think the expectation is they would intervene to try and help de-escalate that situation in some way so that deadly force was not going to be necessary any longer, whether that was to try and help restrain the person in another manner, 
or to provide aid to the officer, um, trying to find a way to de-escalate that situation from a point where deadly force is necessary also feels appropriate in the deadly force section. So I think also, it, but I would also be supportive of adding it to the use of force section. Thank you. And thank you, Kate. Um, <clears throat> Bob, you have your hand up. Yes. <clears throat> in reference to uh, seven, uh, I don't disagree with what Kate has to say. Uh, it makes sense. But I think the instance that we're looking at here is uh, we live in rural Vermont. You know, we're not in, the, in Burlington or the largest cities where you have your backup readily available. And I think there has become instances where uh, you were waiting for backup. And during that time frame, it rose to the level of, OK, unfortunately, this is deadly force has to be uh, the, their only avenue. But upon arrival of another officer from four or five miles away, once you have two officers there, I think this more or less pertains to, OK, maybe deadly force don't have to be used now, now that I'm here. We're going to make sure this stops. And then with two officers, there, I think that's what was the intent number seven here, uh, not the direction that we're going and looking at rural Vermont and how we deal with, with real life issues here out in the field. So can I ask Bob a question to follow up uh, on that? Uh, are you okay with having it in both places like Falco suggested, Bob? Well, I think by having it in both places, the intent is, is different. You're addressing uh, where where do they want to, where do they want to move it, Martin? I'm sorry. I think the idea is to have it in the just the standard use of force section, not the deadly force section. Uh, the idea is if if it's not deadly force, you know, if it's not justified to use deadly force, then the officer should definitely intervene. And you're certainly you know you've raised a slightly different scenario where it may have been justified when there was one law enforcement officer to use that move, but once somebody else shows up you know, they should intervene to, so they can de-escalate essentially. So exactly. it seems like two different purposes, <clears throat> but I just want to confirm whether you're fine with it moving to the, to- have... I think it is because it clarifies both instances, I believe. Okay, I, I agree with Falco and Kate as far as moving it uh, because it's covering one particular uh, situation. But uh, the other situation is that that's real time. That's what's really happening out in the field ever could happen out in the field. But I mean, obviously, I think we all realize that upon arrival of another officer or officers that we probably don't need to uh, still be addressing that maneuver. I think that was the intent of number seven here. So, so uh, just to be clear, you think it should just be in the earlier section or is it fine on both? My reading of it, I don't disagree with moving it, but I think you're missing the intent <clears throat> as it was covered uh, in section seven. Because of the ruralness of Vermont, and there could be an officer here, she had on field by themselves. And at that instance, that was their only avenue while waiting for backup. It's the protection of his or her life. But once another officer or officers arrive on scene, obviously it changes the whole, the whole situation. So well, they probably should intervene, uh, take the individual into custody and prevent anybody from getting seriously injured, obviously. I think there's, there's an instance where this could be used. Sure. So, so that says to me, just to be making sure I'm clear that, that it could stay and it could stay here and it could move to the other, or am I just missing it? What you're saying? Um, I asked, well, and I also see chief uh, Burke's hand up. So. I, I just wanted to offer a little perspective, you know, the intent of the duty to intervene and duty to report unnecessary or unreasonable application of force applies to all uses of unreasonable force in a policy from a policy perspective. I understand um, the need or um, energy behind highlighting chokeholds. Um, I, I fully you know, understand that, but really what we want is cops to stop unnecessary or unreasonable force application by their peers in the field and then report that. And I know that in the po model policy uh, set forth by retired Chief Morrison, that that is uh, fully laid out. So I think you maybe want to reconcile that, the overarching what you want for statutory framework, but also rely on, on the policy and that we want cops to stop improper conduct. Great, thank you. Um, Bob, are you good? Yeah, that was my uh, two cents, yes. Okay, okay, great. Um, 
Rob, I'm gonna I'm gonna wait and move on to um to okay. hear can, can I make a comment on that last dialogue? Um quickly, please. Sure. Yeah. I think the second officer in the scene changes the circumstances, and I think it's already encompassed by your framework of totality of circumstances. And I understand Representative Norris's comment that, or, and Chief Burke's comment, when you have a second officer, the, 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 the circumstances may reduce the need for the degree of force being exerted by the first officer. So I'm not sure how much drafting you need to do when you're within this framework of totality. That's all I wanted to say. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, Bob, your hand is still up. I'm not sure if you had any other questions. Yeah. No. Okay, all right. So um, I am gonna go a little bit over because um, I did want to get um, to James Pepper and um, State's Attorney um, Shriver who has taken the time out of her, her day. Uh, so welcome. Hi, uh, thank you. For the record, James Pepper from the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Um, so I, I thought it would be helpful for the committee when considering uh, H-145 and really Act 165 from last year, which has not gone into effect yet, um, to hear uh, from kind of a prosecutorial angle around um, the ideas around kind of justifiable homicide, self-defense, and how this bill in Act 165 might interplay with some of the decisions um, around use of force or uh, chokehold prosecutions or kind of officer involved shootings, some of the other um, issues that come up. And so I have um, Tracy Shriver, uh, who's the Wyndham County State's Attorney, and she's a 22 year veteran um, and has uh, been involved in many of these reviews of use of force and officer involved shootings. So I figured she might be a good person to help review some of these standards, these burdens of proof, some of the issues around um, use of force prosecutions. Great, thank you, appreciate it. So, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and thank you to the committee for having me. I'll try to keep my comments brief because I know you are uh, close to adjourning. Um, but as Pepper says, I think it's important to have just a little perspective about what happens when the cases come to us. And um, as he indicated, I've done a number of these. Some of the things I wanna stress that I think inform some of the points that have been raised this morning are what we actually do when we get a case to decide whether or not to charge an officer who's involved in an officer involved shooting or involved in an excessive force complaint. And I'm sure you've heard this testimony from others, but um, I think it bears repeating that we do go through the analysis that I see set forth in the law that you've very carefully drafted and then looking at the totality of the circumstances and what a reasonable officer would do in the circumstances, um, especially focusing on what are the policies for use of force, um, what is the training on use of force, what are the circumstances that are presented and what knowledge does the officer have. Something I think that's important to stress is as the prosecutor who's reviewing this case, I get a lot of materials um, and I get body worn cameras, cruiser cameras, cameras from any location where something might've happened. I get reports from the law enforcement officers involved, any civilians involved. So I have this sort of thousand foot view of what went on and I use all of that information to make a decision on whether or not to charge. And if I do charge, all of that information goes to the court to make a decision as well. So I know there's been some commentary about the striking of the language of hindsight. And, and I just wanna say that I understand why that addition would be important because the people who are reviewing, whether it is me, just me or me and the courts, do have a wealth of information that the officer who's involved in that split second decision does not have. Um, the other thing I think is very important to stress is that whether it's an officer involved shooting or it's an excessive force consideration, it's not something that I am sitting here by myself deciding that there's plenty of crimes that I you know, have to make that decision on my own. But these are among obviously some of the most difficult cases to consider. And when it's an officer involved shooting, obviously the attorney general's office is also involved. And that's very helpful to have other prosecutors from outside my own office to talk to about the situation. 
But even when it's an excessive force complaint and it's something that I'm deciding within my office, it's something that I talk with other prosecutors about and obviously the investigators on the case. So it is more of a, a community decision just by the very nature of the way the laws on self-defense and justifiable homicide are written, that it's something that we take into account already community standards. And I think the guidance provided in, in these bills is very helpful in that regard too. I wanna to stress too, that as a prosecutor, um, I have been faced over the 22 years with decisions that, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether this is self-defense or justifiable homicide. And I am very lucky when I'm faced with that decision that I have a couple of different mechanisms that I can use so I don't have to be the sole decider, right? I can charge a case and the judge can decide in the first instance whether or not I'm right. But I also have a jury or a grand jury to help make the decisions. So just to break that out a little bit, very recently here in Wyndham County, we had a shooting of two private citizens. Um, and I wasn't sure if it was self-defense. I really wasn't. Um, my gut told me that I didn't think it was. Um, the person who was shot was, was severely, severely injured, but I knew that it was a community decision. And those were literal words I used in my closing argument to my Wyndham County jury. I said, this is the way the law is written. You decide whether or not this person acted in lawful self-defense and your decision is the final decision. And, and they disagreed with me. And that's the way the system is supposed to work in my perspective on these cases that are so difficult. And a grand jury is another way that we use um, the community input to decide because it's not always clear cut. And in the past, it's pretty easy to go Google some um, newspaper articles about grand juries that have been bought, brought on officer involved shootings. They are supposed to be confidential proceedings. So I can't talk about any in particular, but certainly it's a great tool to take all that evidence that we have about all the totality of circumstances and present it to a, a grand jury, a group of citizens in whatever county to decide what they think about the evidence that's presented. And I raised that because early on in the, your conversations, I was struck by the, the questions about would there be an expert witness on, on the objectively reasonable police officer? And in, in 22 years, I can tell you there, there are experts in everything and, and there could easily be uh, experts on any side of an officer involved shooting or a deadly force case. But in my opinion, uh, the way I practice law in my county, I, I tend to think of um, the community standards on this question and when it is not, as it frequently isn't, a, a clear cut question, um, that reasonable officer decision and answer can come from people who serve on juries and grand juries. So uh, I, I want to leave you time to ask me questions in the few moments you have left, if you have any, but I do also want to thank you for letting me contribute uh, in any way that I can to this important work. And I, I appreciate all the, the time that you all are putting into it. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your, your testimony. It's helpful. Just looking to see if we have any hands up. Uh... Martin, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Um, I, so I guess one, I have a couple questions. The, the without the benefit of the hindsight, I, I'm just trying to understand how that's not captured in the totality of the circumstances when it's facts known to the law enforcement officer at the time. And if you could clarify why that is different. I don't think it's different. Um, I think if he were listening today, my former boss, Dan Davis, would be so thrilled to hear me say this. Um, I think it's a belt and suspenders approach. Uh, that's what <laughs> my, my former boss used to say all the time. Let's do it belt and suspenders. Um, for me, what stands out for me is just the highlighting of the facts, just to hold on a second, prosecutor, hold on a second, <clears throat> court. You know, you have such a wealth of information that the officer in that split second didn't have. Uh, for me, it, it's a highlight. It's not a difference. So just on that belt and suspenders, though, the sometimes your suspenders are a little too tight and they will lift your pants higher than you want them to go than just the belt. So just just so uh, I also like just to ask you about the, the conversation we've had regarding intent and, and in those officer 
uh, in those shootings and such, how is intent looked at currently? And do you have any comments about the offense that we have uh, the prohibited restraint, which would now be the chokehold defense under this amendment? So to your latter point, I, I, I don't like strict liability crimes either. And I would like to see some intent put into a, the chokehold language um, because I certainly have seen, not been involved in obviously like some of the other people who have testified, but certainly have seen situations that get, you know, very jumbled and messy and confusing. And, and there's not an intentional chokehold per se put on someone. And, and I worry about that. Um, currently now, um, yes, we do look at the officer's intent, right? Um, the most recent case I did wasn't an officer involved shooting. And one of the notes that I wrote down that I think is important for the committee to consider is when an officer pulls his or her gun out of their holster, um, aims it and gets ready to fire it, those are all very intentional acts. Like they intend to get their gun out. They intend to fire their gun. Um, when you are wrestling with someone for your life on the ground and trying to protect your life, um, I think that there needs to be some demarcation of an intent by the officer in that situation that they are intending to do what you've very carefully and clearly laid out. And I do like the additions that I saw this morning about chokehold. Um, but I think it would be important to add some intent there. So just to, as a follow-up with this, um, forgetting about whether it's chokehold or anything else, it, it's some other lethal force. So if the officer intends to use the, the firearm and, and intends to use the chokehold, but that intent was somehow based on an unreasonable understanding of whether lethal force or deadly force was justified. How does that weigh into that situation? Well, I think that that goes back to the reasonable officer in the same situation. Um, I know early on uh, there was a question about, well, what about the officer who misses the daily briefing and, and doesn't understand that the person he or she is encountering might be an Alzheimer's patient and, and acts without that knowledge. Um, I think the question has to be in that sort of situation, what are the policies of the particular agency? What would the reasonably prepared officer be doing? And if the reasonably prepared officer should have read that, then that mistake of the facts and the situation should not be I hesitate to use the word, but the only words that are coming to mind are the get out of jail free card, right? Um, we have to use the tools that we are given. And sometimes it's difficult because you're using a reasonable officer or a reasonable person situation in all of these self-defense justifiable homicide cases. But there's a little bit of subjectivity sprinkled in because what did this particular person know and what did that knowledge do for that person? has to be part of the equation. So I, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, uh, Representative, as much as, uh, or, or in the way or correctly from your perspective, but um, that is the, I think that is encompassed by the totality of the circumstances with the reasonable officer. But I, so, so one would, I guess if, um, I'm just trying to still sort this out that, that you knowingly, you know, let's just use an example. You knowingly employ a chokehold uh, under the this offense, uh, but you knowingly employed the chokehold when actually you look at it, and it was pretty obvious that that deadly force wasn't justified for for whatever number of reasons in our standards. Um, how how does that work? Or or you know. Uh, uh, you can use any, any of the, you know, you can recklessly, knowingly, whatever. I mean, I'm just trying to puzzle this out. So perhaps um, the most recent case I could do would help. Um, I, I did a, the Rutland invo officer-involved shooting. And in, in that case, it became very clear that the officer who pulled the trigger on his gun intentionally, right, um, perceived the facts that another officer's life was in danger. And from his point of view, it was 
an absolutely understandable but wrong perception because the officer who he thought was about to be run over by a car that was being slammed into reverse in a very high speed to have the perpetrators exit the scene. The officer by some miracle was able to tuck and roll and get out of the path of that car. So the officer who pulled the trigger was wrong about the facts, but from his perspective, from a reasonable person, from his actual literal perspective and from his knowledge perspective, it appeared that firing his gun was a necessary response to that to try to stop the driver of the car from running over a fellow officer. So I, while I, I use that example of you, you're not gonna accidentally get your gun out to say that those are all very intentional acts, I, I don't mean to say that the intent to stop someone from killing another officer, which is in my example, has to be accurate. I do mean that he has to have intended to use his gun and not accidentally fired it. Is that, did that help? Yeah, yeah, perhaps. And I guess, so I'm trying to understand then if you have any recommendation as far as how we would put intent into uh, the prohibited restraint offense, which also would be called the chokehold offense at this point. And if you have any recommendations or thoughts on that. So my recommendation, um, I thought that the points that were brought up today were excellent, that um, what about using a baton? What about someone who's wearing a scarf or a tie? Like these other things can be a chokehold. And I totally agree with them. If, from my perspective, if there were some way to precisely define a police maneuver of a chokehold, like that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about the accidental wrestling. We're not talking about someone's scarf getting attached to the officer's, you know, radio and, and causing strangulation. Um, if there could be a precise definition of the police, even though we don't teach it, um, maneuver of a chokehold, it seemed to me that that would help. Like if, if the intention was to do that maneuver. So, so you would actually have it in the definition of chokehold, not in uh, the elements of the offense? From my perspective, I think that that would be helpful because that would rule out those unintentional actions. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Great, thank you. So I am um, mindful of the time and we have gone over, but I'm really glad that we got to hear from you and, and hear your testimony. And like I said, uh, we will be coming back to this. We, um, it looks like we might have time uh, tomorrow after the joint assembly or possibly Friday. So I need to see how the rest of today goes in terms of scheduling, but certainly um, I recognize that we did not get through to all our witnesses uh, today. So, uh, so we'll get back to this. So thank you everybody. And I appreciate all the witnesses testimony and everybody um, hanging in here a little bit later. So, okay, with that, we will go off uh, YouTube and adjourn. Thank you.